high in the Himalayas, near the Tibetan border, this is the land of the yak. These animals are closely related to cows, although much less domesticated, and are bred for their milk, meat, and wool. But the yak is a rustic creature. In other words, it has retained many of the characteristics that would allow it to live in the wild. For the yak, this is an asset, helping it to survive in the mountains. But for the herdsman, it poses a challenge. Nearly 12,000 feet above sea level, in the Nepalese village of Manang, the anthropologist Theophil Johnson is studying the relationship between the yaks and the people who farm them. How do Nepalese herdsmen handle this timid animal, which naturally tends to drift away from the group? This is what the researchers hope to understand as they follow the farmers in their daily routine. The aim of my thesis is to observe the domestication process, the ways in which the farmers influence the animals' relationships with one another, as well as how they themselves form and maintain relationships with their herds. One of the greatest challenges for breeders is to bring all their animals back into the fold before nightfall. In the wild, yaks typically live in groups of five or six, whereas a herd can contain anything from 50 to 100 heads of livestock, which makes them more likely to disperse. To prevent this, the farmers act as puppeteers, controlling the animals until they bond. They claim that one way to achieve this is to tie them together. It's a simple technique. By attaching them to a rope overnight, then setting them free in the morning, the young yaks will develop social connections with one another. This means they continue to stick close to their doormates while grazing during the day, which helps them to ensure the herd remains intact. To test the efficiency of this technique, Theophil Johnson is collaborating with the ethologist Cedric Sur. The two researchers fitted transmitters to the yak's necks in order to record their position in relation to one another over the course of several days. This made it possible to obtain a network. Each of these nodes corresponds to an individual, and here we see the connections between the animals. The size of the node increases according to age, and the yaks are positioned in the network based on how many connections they have. Those closest to the center have the most connections, while the ones at the edge are more peripheral. It's as if we're looking at a group of yaks in their own environment. We've been pleasantly surprised to see that the younger individuals are very close to the center of the network. This is something we were hoping to observe in order to confirm our hypotheses on the use of ropes, which has now been very clearly confirmed when you look at the network. Another theory we would like to verify is whether the adults who used to be roped together maintain that connection in any significant way or whether they tend to drift apart. This hypothesis aims to test the extent to which humans are able to modify the animal's behavior. Erika Reen Wichititsky, anthropologist at Nanterre University in Paris, explains the process. Do we as human beings have an influence on the ways in which other species interact with one another? You can study this in rural France or elsewhere in Europe, but these observations are coming from somewhere that's radically different, with very peculiar environmental conditions, a species of herbivore that's totally dissimilar, whether in its behavior or sociability to the animals that we have here in our temperate climate. These interdisciplinary studies, which combine anthropology and ethology, are indeed breaking new ground in the field of yak behavioral studies. You have to bear in mind that there are almost no ethological studies on the behavior of yaks, most probably because of the difficulty involved in reaching these animals, studying them at such a high altitude, and bringing the necessary technology to assess their behavior. The data they've collected can now be compared with previous studies, not only on cows, which are a much less rustic species, but also on wild bison. It's a way of evaluating whether humans have gone too far in their domestication of certain animals. Indeed, while domestication has had benefits for us, it has also had its drawbacks. Sheep, for instance, which are highly domesticated, lose fear of wolves and end up being eaten. 
Or when one of them wanders away and jumps off a cliff, the others will follow. By understanding the distinction between the wild and highly domesticated species, as well as those that are in between, we will have a better idea as to whether domesticated species that retain certain rustic characteristics aren't actually better adapted than the highly domesticated ones we find in the modern world. This question is all the more pressing since Nepalese farmers are faced with a new challenge, the return of the snow leopard, also known as the ghost of the mountains. Over the last 20 years, this predator, feared by some and protected by others, has become an increasingly common sight in the Manang Valley. Herds are suffering increasingly heavy losses, and just like in France with its wolves and bears, the farmers are very upset about this growing threat to their livelihoods and even their survival. Here we have the remains of the body of a yak, which was killed by a snow leopard. Protectors of the leopards have asked the farmers to leave as much meat as they can in the big cat's hunting grounds, so they can feed themselves and hopefully won't come back for a while. But leaving food for the leopard is very painful for the farmers, who can't help coming back to collect as much of the lost meat as possible. Poaching and the destruction of its natural habitat have made the snow leopard an endangered species. As a result, the animal is heavily protected within the Nepalese national parks. The penalty for killing a snow leopard is just as severe as it is for killing a human being. That is, 15 to 20 years in prison. In the space of four years, the researcher has observed a number of new strategies devised by farmers in an attempt to limit the damage caused by this new predator. Breeders have abandoned certain grazing areas and are even considering giving up their daytime activities so as to be able to keep a permanent watch on their herd. Will these changes help herders to survive? Will the conservationists manage to protect conflict between the snow leopard and the people of Manang? Keeping a balance between humans and animals, whether they be domesticated or wild, will depend on the success of these new techniques.